Bonjour, salut, hello, and welcome. Thank you for tuning in to this afternoon's panel as part of the Word on the Street Toronto's 2021 Festival, our 32nd annual and second fully virtual festival. I'm Sienna, your host, and we are excited to be presenting Fan Fiction, Their World is Your Playground, a discussion of the art of fan fiction and what this practice teaches our writers. Before we dive into our discussion, we need to recognize the land which we occupy. The Toronto of today exists because of the Toronto Purchase, also known as Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation in 1805 with a final claim settlement in 2010. Whilst Toronto also recognizes the history of the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, and the Seneca Nations in this territory. The place in which Watts operates is the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which is an agreement to care for and share the resources around the Great Lakes in peace. Toronto, or Tkaranto, is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples with long histories on this land. And acknowledging this is only the first step in building a practice of land stewardship and Indigenous solidarity that honors these peoples. We encourage you to educate yourself about the land that you occupy, wherever it is that you're tuning in from. Just a few announcements before we introduce today's panelists. I mentioned off the top that this is the second virtual Word on the Street Festival in our 32 year history, but that is not strictly true because this year's celebration also includes some special COVID safe in-person author signings at local Toronto bookstores, which continue today at Queen Books in the East End and Friday at Page and Panel, otherwise known as the TCAF shop. You can check out our website or our Instagram Reels page to see the signing schedule for both shops. And don't forget to sign up for our upcoming panels either. This is day seven of our 10-day festival celebrating storytelling, ideas, and imagination. Later today, we will be joined by Adrienne DeLeon, Angela Rebrek, Chantal Gibson, and Nisha Patel for our Word Vancouver panel, Poetry for the Future. Following that, we will have Hard Feelings, Processing Trauma Through Writing, a discussion with Brent Laporte, Holly Gattery, Jacob Shear, and Kathy Friedman. All information about our upcoming panels can be found on our website at toronto.thewordonthestreet.ca. If you want to be the first to know about new videos from The Word on the Street, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, where you can find all the panels from this year's festival. And if you enjoy today's talk, please give this video a like to help others find it as well. Now, I am ecstatically pleased to welcome our moderator for this panel, my wonderful, beautiful Yelly Cruz. Yelly is a Venezuelan Canadian award winning writer. Her writing explores themes related to family, cultural diasporas, body freedom, and of course, love. She has poetry published in several literary magazines, including Carte Blanche, Contemporary Verse 2, and others. When she's not writing stories and producing diet culture busting podcasts, she loves wearing cozy yellow sweaters and fighting for body liberation for all. Yelly, it is my pleasure to welcome you. I'm so glad you could join us this afternoon. <laughs> Yay, thank you, Fiona. Well, I'm gonna hand it off to you, but have a wonderful time talking to our panelists. Amazing, thank you. I am so thrilled to be here and I'm thrilled to introduce all of our amazing panelists for today. So I'll just go ahead and get started. All right, so Natalie Zena Walshot is a writer and a game designer. She is the author of Hench, a novel about the mistreated and undervalued employees of supervillains which was a finalist on the 2021 season of Canada Reads and nominated for a Locus Award for Best First Novel. Heck yeah. Her work also includes LARP scripts, heavy metal music journalism, video game lore, and weirder things classified as interactive experiences. Her writing on the interactive adventure, The Aluminum Cat won an Indiecade Award and her poetic exploration of the notes engine in Bloodborne was featured in Kotaku and First Person Scholar. She plays a lot of D&D, &D, participates in a lot of Nordic LARPs, watches a lot of horror movies, and reads a lot of speculative fiction. She lives in Toronto with her partner, four cats, two mantises, and a jumping <laughs> spider. Holy heck, thank you, Natalie, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much for that amazing intro. Uh, I super appreciate it. And I am like over the moon thrilled to be here. Amazing, thank you. All right, and our next guest 
An Ottawa teacher by day, Brandon Crilly has more than 30 published short stories to date by markets including Fusion Fragment, Daily Science Fiction, and Flame Tree Publishing. He reviews fiction for Blackgate.com and serves as a programming lead for CanCon. Thanks for joining us today, Brandon. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. And our third guest today is Carrie C. Byrne. Carrie is an autistic, queer, and non-binary writer and award-nominated publisher and editor living in Toronto. They are the co-founder and CEO of the Augur Magazine Literary Society and the publisher of Augur Magazine. As a writer, their work is forthcoming and or published in Fantasy Magazine, This Magazine, The Thames Review, and others. The rest of the time, they're diving deep into the endless void that is their homebrew <laughs> D&D world. Thanks for joining us today, Carrie. Thank you. All right. I um, I mentioned this earlier, but today I've just been pacing around my house waiting <laughs> for this to begin. So I'm just over the moon to be here. Um, could we maybe go around and give a little introduction to ourselves and then also say your connection to fan fiction? I want to know all about your nerdy side. So maybe we can start with Natalie over here and kind of go around in a circle to begin. Sure. Um, I think perhaps as my bio may have indicated, my ner there's no nerdy side. It's, it's like a nerdy sphere <laughs> or perhaps orb that surrounds me at all times. Um, so I've, I've been playing like role playing games since I was, you know, 12 or 13 years old. I've been playing video games since I was a lot smaller. All, all of those uh, incredibly dorky things have profoundly influenced both the person that I am uh, and also the work that I do. Um, and I, I, fan fiction was the first thing I wrote seriously. Um, I would say I started, I was probably only like nine or something when uh, I started to write um, terrible self-insertion adventure, adventures uh, about the Phantom of the Opera. Um, like one does, you know, perfectly average child. Um, but it was the first thing I wrote consistently that I kept doing. Um, it was it was a the first fictional world I inhabited uh, and, you know, over time gradually amassed that. And I think it taught me a ton about world building uh, and a, you know, a, a ton about how to be a writer in general. So I'd, I'd say, honestly, my relationship to fan fiction is, is very close to the cornerstone of my creative practice. For sure, thank you. How about you, Brandon? Um, oddly very similar. Um, one of the things that I, I love, um, I guess about all, all three of us, potentially all four of us, if it includes the Ellie, is that we all play D&D. Um, mm -hmm. that's, like these days, that's a huge piece of what I, like I, I DM for a bunch of writers here in Ottawa. And so that's, you know, a lot of the collaboration that I do these days, but, um, I started in much the same way as Natalie, very first thing I ever wrote was very much fan fiction. Um, and for me, it was Pokemon when I was a kid, that was the first thing that I was like, write little stories, but, and, and, you know, except starring me and my friends. And mm -hmm. then it was, it was Star Wars stuff starring me and my friends. And then it was, <laughs> um, you know, uh, Hogwarts which was, if anybody looked at it, was basically an exact ripoff of the Philosopher's Stone, almost like <laughs> word for word, but starring my friends. And then, and then you know, <laughs> like, went on and on and on. Um, and the, uh, in terms of like learning about um, writing and, and this like mystique that I had as a kid of being a writer, um, like the first novel, and I use the air quotes very deliberately there that I wrote when I was a kid, was basically Star Trek with the serial numbers incredibly badly filed off. Um, but I was so <laughs> excited <laughs> and wanted to show it to everybody. Um, and then very quickly learned that that not necessarily everybody wanted to see that. And so um, it, like it, there was that sort of learning process too, but it um, never diminished my fun. And, and fan fiction is one of those things that um, I keep telling myself I need to do more now um, and, and, and keep trying to get back to it. I think it's so incredibly important. So that, that was my start until I got to do it. Amazing. I already know that I need all of these links. I need all of this, all of this content. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Carrie? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll put up a hand for the nerd sphere. Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you know, when I was like 
before I used to measure time in Sailor Moon episodes. Nice. Um, so, you know, it would be like, Mom, we're waiting for the bus. How many Sailor Moon episodes until it gets here? That would be just like how I how I did things. So it's, mm. it's no surprise that the first thing that I ever wrote was like a, a very much a Sailor Moon, a little bit of Cardcatcher Sakura in there, but like very mm -hmm. Sailor Moon um, short story. Although there was a unicorn um, and I, you know, the Pegasus arcs hadn't come out yet. So I was ahead of my time. Like I knew, I knew it was coming. Um, <laughs> And that just never really stopped. Like through most of my life growing up, there was there were points of fan fiction. Like through, uh, I mean, I was a, a secret piece of information about me is that I uh, ran one of the biggest anime guilds on Neopets when I was like twelve. Um, oh my nice. God. We would host like anime role play days on that because you know you run full programming. You're a twelve year old, but you're also a CEO. <laughs> um, and then when I was in middle school, um, I think it was called like AnimeSpiral.com. It's long gone. Like I don't think you can even find it on a way back machine. Um, and you know, huge lean into Inuyasha fan fiction there. Just mm -hmm. like, just like, and I really liked imagining like what what came next so like also when i was in elementary school like i created oh i wish i'd pulled out the pictures that would have been great but i created like five extra seasons worth of main characters for digimon yes um and it just you know i think i just didn't want worlds to end and i didn't want mm -hmm. the experience of those worlds to end and creating my own extensions of those was something that just like made me feel good and safe and happy mm -hmm. and like it was something that i could just go and wrap myself in Mm -hmm. For sure. Mm -hmm. All of these um, fandoms that everyone has listed has like unlocked tons of memories <laughs> that I <laughs> forgot about. <laughs> um, and Carrie, you were mentioning that these worlds that we decide to dive into and live in are so special. And that leads in perfectly to my next question, which is what are either currently right now or in the past, some of your favorite worlds and universes that you dove into either as a writer of fan fiction or as a reader of fan fiction and what makes those worlds so special and so fun <laughs> we can do this popcorn style anybody can go first if you have something to say i've got one but i don't, I don't want okay. to go for it brandon or, yeah yeah do it or, 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 I, I lied i have two um <laughs> Um, one of the, the uh, worlds that I keep coming back to, did anybody watch the TV show Fringe? Fringe is amazing. Right? Is it not one of like the greatest shows ever? 10 out of 10. Absolutely. Or, oh, okay, good. Yeah. I, I'm glad I'm not alone. Um, there are scenes no, from love Fringe, it. If, if I'm stuck in a rut, like for a really emotional scene, I'll go back and rewatch scenes with like Peter and Walter and, and stuff. And and like for anyone who hasn't seen Fringe, it's like this, this kind of weird science parallel universe x Filesy sort of show. Um, and the thing I loved about it, aside from, you know, the, the weird science bit was that it really, really more than anything else, it's about this kind of quirky, incredibly broken quasi found family. Like some of the people are related to each other and, and some of them aren't, and they start off the show barely and not even trusting each other. Um, and then by the end, we'll like, we'll literally sacrifice whatever they have to do in order to protect each other. And, and that, tr that journey for them is some of the best storytelling I think I've ever come across. And mm -hmm. and so I love that world and I love those characters. And then when it ended, which kind of goes to what Carrie was saying about not wanting a world to end, mm -hmm. like I was like, okay, no, there like it was it was a really, really solid ending, I thought, but I'm like there needs to be to be more. Why can't I have more? <laughs> and so I've got reams of pages of like, here's what I would do next. Um and and if I ever get the opportunity to write it or, or take the time to write it, I would I like I need to because just the characters were absolutely, absolutely mm -hmm. brilliant. Um, and taught me a lot about um, uh, character relationships and, and getting characters to trust each other and, and like, you know, and then breaking those relationships, how you get those relationships back together and reconnect. Um, so he's like easily one of my favorites for, for that and taught me a ton just kind of imagining what those characters might do in a different scenario or, or what might happen next. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a really great. I also love the fringe universe and um, when you were talking, I realized that this is by no means anything resembling like a rule, but I do mm -hmm. think that um, fan fiction is particularly well supported by um, fandoms that contain some kind of reference to the multiverse, because you can kind of like 
things can phase in and out of canon, right? Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. you, so because there are multiple canonical timelines all often running, you know, par simultaneously, the MCU is another really good example of this. There's tons of others. Um, you, like the universe can support the existence of fan fiction and in particular, even yours as a, a candidate for multiversal reality. So there's there's kind of a template there in the universe to, to hold it up, which, um, and there's of course, tons and tons of fandoms that don't have that, but, mm -hmm. um, but it is there. Um, I loved uh, Farscape a lot, like a lot. Um, and uh, it did not have a very satisfying ending, which I think is part of what, uh, you know, kind of spurred me to spend more time there. It's like, I need to fix this <laughs> in some way. Um, also, uh, Scorpius is very attractive and I was young and confused. So a thing <laughs> definitely was happening there. Um, very good fashion. So uh, that's definitely, definitely a, a part of it too, is um, how can I, there's kind of a like, I want this universe. I love this universe so much. I want to spend time there. It's a safe place. It's something mm -hmm. I want to wrap myself in. But there's also, I need to fix this universe. Like there's something here that doesn't fit or it, there is, there's friction or, um, you know, there's, there's something about it where I can't settle in comfortably. Um, so I'm going to change it so that it does. Uh, and I find that, you know, this is, this can be seen in just how much, for example, queer content there is in fan fiction. It's like, so there aren't enough canonically queer characters. So I'm going to introduce that or I'm going to expand that or spend more time there. Um, you know, and this can be all kinds of different relationships. This can be all kinds of different, you know, can just be narrative threads, but it's, it's that desire to, I don't want to say correct, but build alternate uh, possibilities within that structure as well. Mm -hmm. In terms of the universes that I fell into, I think that like the biggest one for me was when I was like 12, 13, 14, and that was Inuyasha, just like, oh yeah, full, like fell down that well, um, yeah. so to speak. <laughs> um, I think another one though was, and this one's interesting because it's not uh, fan fiction, fan fiction. It was like when I was in high school, I was in role play communities on Gaia Online, written role play communities. Um, and I started a Final Fantasy based uh, or, uh, role play. Mm -hmm. And that actually, but it was, it was by virtue of that kind of like multiple universes within the franchise mm -hmm. scenario, it was really just an original conceit that borrowed from a lot of kind of tropes and uh, storylines within the games. And that actually has now mm -hmm. been like totally transformed into my completely homebrew D and D world that I've played like four written 460 hours up in the last like year and a half. Um, so like in terms of a world like, and but at this point it's just the feeling, you know, like it's just like right. it's vaguely associated in feeling with my experience of playing the games but right. it is like tied to that. And so like, that's also really interesting is like that iterative nature and like how you mm -hmm. become influenced by it. And I think that we'll talk about that more uh, yeah, like, based on your questions. But um, yeah, I think that there was like reading Deep in Yash, a little bit of Fruits Basket. Um, oh, also, yeah. yeah, also on the like multiverse data and the like sense of incompletion, like one of the pieces that I wrote was a Full Metal Alchemist um, slash Chrono Crusade crossover, um, Ooh, only those on the anime whole. Yeah, where like <laughs> at the end of the original anime for Full Metal Alchemist, you know, then the movie, they're like, he's in New York. And you're like, okay. Um, <laughs> but you know, what takes place in New York in 1920s is Chrono Crusade. And they both do the same, <laughs> like one does the seven sins, the other does the seven virtues. So there was a lot of like, thematic consistency. Um, so also got deep down into there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's all it's all so complex and something that uh, you all touched on a little bit that I uh, hadn't even thought about before is how a lot of times fan fiction comes as a result of these like consumers of stories wanting to change the narrative a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, 
I remember The Vampire Diaries was my first big mm. fandom mm-hmm. because that's what was on TV when I was in middle school. And uh, what spurred me to write was when Elena switched over and ended up with David. And that rage that I felt inside in my heart really uh, mm-hmm. drove me to rewrite that narrative. Um, and I loved, Natalie, as well, that you mentioned that fan fiction gives us this platform to write in stories with queer folks and disabled folks and neurodivergent folks and people of color and all of these identities that aren't highlighted. Um, When I was in my undergrad, I wrote a paper called Kissing Harry Styles, and it was an analysis (laughs) of how the Harry Styles fandom on Tumblr has written all of these fan fictions and reader inserts with people in those identities. Um, Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering what what about fan fiction allows for folks to see themselves in the, their favorite stories and plop themselves in and why, what makes that so special? I mean, it's a radical act, right? To not see yourself in a story um, and say, uh, and say, fuck it, I'm putting myself in mm-hmm. or I'm putting, I'm, there's so little representation for me or of me or, um, that I am not only demanding that there is more, but I am ensuring in whatever small way that I can that it exists. Um, so it's it's not it's a it's a it's a I think again like pretty radical act of refusing to be content with a world as it is and literally changing the shape of it in the way that you want. And that's amazing. Right. Like that's incredibly powerful work. Um, And I I feel like a a lot of um, self-insertion fic gets kind of a bad rap uh, and is kind of like pooped on a little bit. And I think that, uh, you know, there's there's sort of the like classic identity of the Mary Sue. Right. Which is like, oh, so you've written like a version of yourself that's perfect, that gets to kiss whatever character you think is cute or whatever. Um, Yeah. Yes, I did. <laughs> because I get to I get to write it, right? Like I I get to change myself and my identity however I want into whatever, you know, silly or idealized or perfect or flawed form that I see myself in and place myself in the story I want to be in um as a way to again like reclaim some of that representation. I think that's fantastic and important and is both a, a, a really powerful act, both of world building and identity building. Yeah, I actually, if you don't mind, can I, I know we aren't on an actual official question, but I'd love to jump in on that. Yeah, yeah, please. Um, so like what you kind of reminded me of is like when I was in that role play community, when I was in my high school era, um, I thought I was a cis woman, um, of course. And But when I was in that space, for absolutely no reason that I could discern at the time, um, I just pretended to be a boy, like just straight up pretended to be a boy. And I only wrote men. Um, And then like after about like, and like in all of these worlds, like only wrote male characters. And there was this weird bias of like, we don't have enough boys writing boys. So like, I was very popular. Um, And, you know, then I came out as a woman after like about two years, or I guess a girl. And then, you know, like 10 years later, came out again to the friends that I still had from that time being like, hey, actually they, them, trans mask, so joke's on me. Um, (laughs) And I think that that level of like play and fictionality really gave me space to like, not just like, like the the fiction was like the goal because I was like, oh, I want to get better at writing men was like the thought in my brain. And I want to get better at writing men within these worlds that I love. Um, but then that like was then like, oh, like, you know what, I'll just like be a guy online because that seems convenient for writing men. Mm-hmm. And I and that let me have this whole secret space that I was not going to get in my like decently conservative smaller city in uh, Ontario Mm -hmm. and so not only just like writing writing ourselves in in terms of like actual storylines or actual worlds but also in the ways that that fictionality can affect like how you experiment with yourself in online spaces where you are not like immediately there Mm -hmm. totally you can play around with your persona almost online Mm -hmm. as a writer Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah for me it 
um, again, when I was when I was in high school, it, it was a, like a different sort of safe space for me, and in, in terms of identity and, and uh, representation and stuff, obviously a little bit different for me. Um, but I remember on we were doing the uh, text based um, kind of collaborative storytelling role playing form. I wish I remembered the platform, um, but I can't after all these years. But um, basically telling you it was like uh, high school but with magic like sort of sort of original content but very heavily based on, on everything that was out there at the time and for me the the safe space was again it goes back to, to uh, character relationships but specifically romance it was mm -hmm. it was this like at the time you know in the real world um you know i was in what was at the time, I mean, when I was in high school, a very problematic relationship um, and continued to be a very problematic relationship and didn't really realize it at the time. Um, but in the in the story world, we had, you know, multiple people who were building characters and, and um, you know, speaking to each other and, and building this story. And it, um, it was an opportunity for me in, in retrospect to, you know, see, like, you know, get, you know, created like as a fictional character, um, you know, let's meet this other character and come in to see what happens and then slowly start to learn somebody in a way that, you know, in a, in a kind of trusting and, and compassionate sort of way that I hadn't experienced yet. Um, mm -hmm. And which again, at the time, I think like very much didn't realize how important that was to me, but it was a way to kind of, you know, let like explore something that was sh like, was so important to me at the time. I feel like I'm repeating myself, but, but it, it was huge. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and just a way to, to see that, it, like in a way that nobody was going to judge because of the story world was fictional we were all just kind of having fun and no one was going to think about it and so i could, we could just kind of do what we wanted if that makes sense mm -hmm. um and and so yeah so that like that ability to create together with people who i trusted was so so important at the time absolutely for sure it sounds like um everybody has kind of touched on this notion of fan fiction and also community and the mm -hmm. fact that they kind of go hand in hand. And I would love to talk about that a little bit more and explore um, like how does writing and sharing fan fiction on Tumblr or Wattpad or AO3 or any of these other platforms nourish community in a way that's very um, unique and special? Well, I mean, the, the like beta readers, you know, what like we would now call like early editors or, you know, you know, the, that sort of first round of feedback that you get on your early drafts, like that's really built in to the fanfic community, right? Like you are heavily encouraged to respond and give constructive criticism or just talk about what you really liked and what you connected to. And that for sure doesn't mean everybody is good at it or compassionate at it or, you know, whatever. Like there's, there are definitely, like I, I was there Gandalf when the flame wars broke out, like it's, it can be bad, but uh, it can also be really extraordinary. And I think that uh, I know that as I like, moved on to writing more and more original content like it's it's a lot easier to talk somebody into reading something that exists in a fictional world they already know and love than it is like hey can you you read my thing in set in a completely different universe than anything you are familiar with like it's a harder sell mm -hmm. um so I think that that uh, there's a real power there in being able to get like a relatively like huge volume of feedback um, in a relatively small space that 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 can be incredibly valuable early on. Mm -hmm. It's funny. I, I, um, I'm going to come to it a little tangentially because I uh, I'm lucky enough that I get to teach creative writing um, at the high school where I am. Um, and uh, one of the weeks, like one of the modules we do is is on fan fiction. And when I tell the students that that's what we're going to be doing, a bunch of them are like, "Wait, we're going to do what?" <laughs> really? And then, and then, and then one of the, inevitably one of them will say, "Sir, we're going to talk about AO3." And I'm like, "Of course, we're going to talk about AO3." And then they lose their minds because they wait. Like, <laughs> is like, <laughs> and then you see all the like all these heads pop up like, "Well, I'm on there. Are you on there?" And then they and and just they've never crossed paths on in that space before. And and what I see in those students that I think is really really interesting is like prior to that module those are the students who have been um most of them have been more willing to share their work in class um because they've already done that so like they're used to that right. sort of thing and then what i noticed too is that they're the ones who either intentionally or unconsciously 
are trying to foster that sort of community in the classroom. They're trying to bring other students in. They're trying to like, you know, get people collaborating and, and, and they, they're way more effective at it than I am um because it's them like, like it's their it's their community and, and they're the same age and so they, they can interact that way um and so i think like seeing that in them like that experience of being you know whether it's ao3 or tumblr or wattpad or, or what have you builds this sort of resiliency really really early um that like oh you know i'm going to show this to so and so and they might not like it and, and they might tear it apart and that's okay um and the earlier that you can have that experience as a creative person i think the, the better off you are um in order to kind of navigate what is really a minefield of getting feedback um, at the end of the day. For sure. You sound like the coolest creative writing teacher. <laughs> <laughs> I, my partner and I compete, and luckily she's not watching this, but yes, I am the coolest. <laughs> <laughs> You've won the cool off. <laughs> you yeah, okay. <laughs> what about you, Carrie? I think that for me, it's more on a level of like community organizer. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, when I look back, like these spaces were always the spaces in which I was organizing, like from that young age. Like I think I started organizing community on Neopets when I was like 10 um, and, you know, taught myself all of these skills to like recruit people, to engage them, to like find out what they wanted, to deliver on their needs. Then that moved over to Gaia Online where I created a community around like very specific guidelines. The guidelines that they use on guideline as of a few years ago were still the guidelines that my friends and I set up when we were there. Like oh my gosh. there was like a lot That's of so organizational cool. power from this child. <laughs> <laughs> and then from there, you know, that influenced when I was at the University of Toronto, I started a speculative fiction journal that still exists. And it's been a long time since I was there now. So that's also pretty cool. But like the reason that I was able to like recruit people to that and train people for that was because I'd been doing that in these kind of collaborative writing and or fan spaces um, where I shared that passion with people. And then I was like, okay, time to bring it to the real world. And then being able to do that with the spec was what allowed me to create Augur um, mm -hmm. in kind of the real, real world. Because, you know, I, when I was doing the spec, I was applying for grants at a university level. Right. And that taught me how to apply for grants in the real world. <laughs> um, love you granting bodies. Um, <laughs> but, so like the the entire reason that I exist within my space in writing and speculative fiction now is because I learned all of those skills just because I loved something a lot. And it's also why, you know, like I always say that how well I'm doing as a leader or an organizer, like that is up to the people that I organize to tell me. Mm -hmm. um, but feedback is generally pretty good. So like, I will look at really that. And the only reason I think that is, um, outside of just trying really hard, is all of the skills that I learned and like messed up on when I was 12, 13, 15, 16 in those spaces and all of the ways in which I worked out kinks in those community ways then. Um, and the reason that I was willing to do that was because I loved something a lot. Like mm -hmm. I did not at 13 love being a community organizer. I loved, I loved anime and I wanted, <laughs> because I was a secret extrovert. I didn't know it yet. Um, I thought I was an introvert and no, all um, because I, was a secret <laughs> extrovert. I wanted to share that love with people and I wanted to write with people and create things with people. And that sense, have that sense of like, like my love of something, like I just wanted to find other people that shared that. And like, that just gave me my life. Like it gave me like the best part of my life this day, these days is Augur. Like that group of people, that work, like what we're able to create together. And I don't think I would be a different pe person without it. And I wouldn't have it if I had not had those spaces that I created when I was young. So for me, it's like a very, that community is a very shaping, shaping thing. Mm -hmm. Wow, yeah, that's so special. Um, I guess kind of to hop off of what Carrie was saying about this like development of skills and identity and all of those magical things, is there, are there any ways in which writing fic has helped you as a writer of your own original content? Um, whether it's relating to your personal writing style or voice, are there any skills that you've taken from one to the other? I have a lot of opinions on this. So if ever, anyone else would like to go first, I highly encourage you to do so. <laughs> I can go first on this one. Please, yeah, yeah. Um, so 
I think that for me it was building blocks. Um, I was not a prolific writer of specifically fan fiction. I did write fan fiction. Um, I read a lot more than I wrote at the time. Mm -hmm. Or that's not true. I wrote a lot for a lot of first chapters. Let's put it that way. <laughs> um, uh -huh. And then, uh, and then, like the role play, of course. Um, but I think that the building blocks were huge. Like even just in terms of like what is a chapter and like how do I structure that and like getting feedback on that. Um, but then I think the other thing that's been really interesting for me today and the way that I am engaging with like kind of fan culture or trope culture now um, is that with aforementioned D&D, as I mentioned, Endless Void, um, or as you mentioned, Yelly, I guess, uh, I, you know, doing a weekly Dungeons and Dragons session where you are coming up with like six to nine hours of playable content every week, which is how long our sessions run, um, you have to, it's not all just going to be original content. It's just not like you have to see. <laughs> um, originally I was writing like 12 page, like full written documents wow. um, for each one. And then that became not sustainable. Uh, but, you know, I am now borrow like I'll borrow from tropes. I'll, like right now we're going through like a battle tower um, season in our D&D &D campaign, which means that like even now I am playing with these tropes that come from my fan culture because, you know, it's based on like Hunter Hunter or Tower of God or like things like that and playing with that and seeing how it functions with these characters. And then that in turn is turning me into a much more powerful serial writer mm -hmm. um, in a way that I never thought that I would be. I never thought that I'd be comfortable with serial writing. And I think that like leaning on those building blocks or leaning on those tropes based on familiarity and love, like that has really helped me also lose anxiety in writing um, because you, you just gain a trust in yourself when you're working with those things and you're like, oh, I can transform this. I can jump off of this. I can like use this to grow. Um, it doesn't mean that you're sealing, you're just kind of experimenting and playing. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Natalie, do you want to go ahead? Or... Um, sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. Why not? Um, so I think fan fiction has kind of honestly taught me more about writing than almost anything else. Um, and in two very important ways, one of which is related to world building, um, which is so not every piece of fiction, whether that's a television show or a novel or whatever, inspires a fandom, not as in it doesn't have fans, but it does, they don't always inspire like a big, active, healthy, thriving community on say AO3. And part of this is popularity, sure, but part of it is also there are some worlds that are more fun to spend time in. And there are some worlds with better world building and that feel more real and complicated and have more corners that you want to explore and spend more time in. And when you spend time in those communities, whether it's, you know, you're, you're kind of reading the canon content and then kind of spiraling out from there, you get to see what it is about those worlds and those stories that work. And like, why are people coming back to this? Why are people trying to spend time here? What about this is so nurturing and fun and appealing? Um, and you can take all of those lessons about like what a attracts people to a fictional world or a fandom and apply that to your own writing. And I think it's incredibly powerful. The other thing uh, is fanfic is so wrapped up in wish fulfillment um, and it can be personal wish fulfillment, right? It can be, this is the, the thing I wanna read and I can't find it. And now I have a blank page, here we go, right? Like there's, there's definitely that like desire to fiction pipeline. Um, but it's also wish fulfillment in terms of like you read a story and you wish two characters had had a different relationship. So you make it or you wish that like you just want to see what the Avengers are like when they're hanging out together, you know, at like Tony starts making coffee in the morning and they just like have a minute to relax. Like you want you get to fulfill that wish to see all the parts of that fiction and the parts of those characters that you can't in the canon text. Um, and when you get, when you really study that wish fulfillment, like what are the sorts of stories people are writing over and over again? What are the wishes that they wish, like that they, that they dream of their fiction fulfilling, that it doesn't, that they then go and 
you know, because there are like, there's a lot of repetition there. There's a lot of um, like, there are, there are a lot of dreams and wishes that kind of come up over and over again. And you can kind of see like certain templates repeating. And that's also an incredibly powerful thing to put into your own work, right? Like you can, you can build the kinds of relationships, you know, people want more of, and you can, you know, like, like, learn so much about a slow burn romance and why people are drawn to it. And then write those if you want to, um, to fulfill those, you know, same kind of those needs that you see in your potential readership. Um, and I think that that kind of, um, and, and fulfill your own wishes too, right? Like, what do you love to read? It turns out you can just make that. Like, you don't have to make what you think is good or serious or you should be writing. Like, you can literally just write what you want to and the things that you enjoy to read. And all, all of that are, like, that's incredibly powerful and they're incredibly important lessons that uh, that you can lift directly from fanfic. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, I, I love that that focus on, 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 wish fulfillment and love and, and, and learning from it. Like for me, I think it always comes back to, to character and, and mm -hmm. my understanding of character relationships and, and how characters interact comes from unpacking some of my you know, the favorite relationships that, um, that I've seen in fiction. Mm -hmm. um, and then in terms of my, like my process today, like the novel that I have out on uh, submission right now, like at its core started out as you know basically a love letter to one of my favorite fandoms and what i did was like it's this ensemble piece of characters and, and i looked at you know like why was i so in love with this particular batch of characters what about them and, and the way they interacted with each mm -hmm. other had me interested and i kind of drilled down okay you know this character is sort of the, like this archetype and 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 they bounce well off this character and and, and whatnot um and and that gave me that foundation to come up with my own kind of, you know, original content twists on that stuff. And and then, okay, you know, what situation am I going to put them in? And then what world am I going to put them in? And I start building out. No, no. Um, if you were to look at the the novel now, I don't know that you would be able to make the connection to where it started. Right. But, but that's kind of the point. Like, at least right. for this, is a, you know, it's something that I wanted to eventually be original content. Um, but it like, but I know exactly where all those little threads are. Um, mm -hmm. and it makes it more, like, it makes it fun for me. It's because like, I read through and I, okay, that's, you know, like that particular piece of dialogue, I know what character that, or what, uh, what character inspired that. Um, and I think without that foundation in this, this other fandom and kind of thinking about it originally, like in its very early days as fanfic, it would not be anywhere nearly as strong of a, a story as it is. Um, and so I think like that, that sort of lesson I think is so incredibly important and so incredibly useful. I love that. You get to know all of the little secrets that nobody yeah, else mm -hmm. does. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you all for your answers so far. I've loved geeking out with you all. Um, we have a couple of amazing questions from the audience. So I want to dive into those and make sure that we get a chance to answer them. First question is, it is a radical act to write your identity into a story that doesn't represent it, to expand your craft through writing fan fiction, but how does it feel when the authors of those texts become limiting about fan fiction? Like Anne Rice threatening legal action, how George R.R. R. Martin thinks it shouldn't be legal as copyright infringement, Diana Gabaldon saying that it's immoral and illegal. <laughs> what are your thoughts on all of that? <laughs> <laughs> like, I'll I'll release a collective sigh. Yeah, we'll, we'll, <laughs> um, to me, you know, not. I'm like, how polite do I want to be about this? I, I like, it's funny that it's those particular names that are mentioned because mm -hmm. like individuals like that should feel under no threat whatsoever by <laughs> anything. Yeah, like mm -hmm. you're the friggin' Titan of our industry. What's going to happen? Like, and, and, and so it, like, it, it honestly like bothers me when, when a creator who has inspired so many people does crap like that. And, mm -hmm. And, and it's just, and, and to me, it like Mars, their own legacy by doing that sort of thing. They, like you have people who love your world enough that they want to play in it. Just let, just let them play. Like, why is that, like, it, so that's my very hard sort of screw you opinion, I guess, but. Right. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's a total load of crap. Like, 
<laughs> for, for, for a lot of those reasons. I think a lot of ideas around copyright infringement are crap <laughs> to begin with. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, just to really echo what, what Brandon said, like, what are you afraid of? Like what, you know, and, and are, are you actually, no one's making any money here for sure of, you know, on, on their like, uh, like self insertion song device and fire fic here. Like it's not, it's not happening. So a calm down. Um, but that that kind of like no, this is mine. Gaspingness of all these ideas is is something I have very little patience for, because um, it's it's like it's such an honor to have somebody want to spend more time in something that you made. It seems deeply wrong minded to me. Um, yeah, and also the idea that it's immoral is is actively funny as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> like there are so many things that are actually terrible, you know, <laughs> like capitalism, <laughs> for example, like yeah. that that are in fact awful, that do real harm to people. But like, yeah, my, my Inuyasha fic is immoral. That's the, that's <laughs> the hard line you drop. Okay, so yeah, yeah I don't know, man. <laughs> I'm gonna, so on the level of capitalism, so in my day job, I'm a marketer. <laughs> Um, I'm a B2B marketer. And within marketing, we have this concept of, uh, you know, you rank your success with customers, you have a net promoter score. So you get ranked at a 10, you want to stay at around a nine or a 10. People that are in the nine or 10 range are considered evangelists. Now, people who write fan fiction, those are your evangelists. People who write fan fiction are the reason that conventions exist. Mm -hmm. and yes. Conventions are where you make a shit ton of money. And conventions don't exist without the people that are nine or tens. And your community finds one another and amplifies their experience of your work in these spaces for free. You literally cannot <laughs> buy marketing that is as productive as these spaces because when you get a bunch of neurodivergent teens in a room, they're not gonna stop talking about it. You can't pay people to talk <laughs> about your shit with that level of excitement. Yeah. So for me, when you're coming after these people, you are literally coming after the most powerful marketing engine that you have. And it shows a gross misunderstanding of how publishing will continue to exist and grow into the future, especially with Titans like Wattpad, where mm -hmm. those people will become the purchasers and the way that they are currently engaging with texts will be how they engage with text in 10, 20 years. Mm -hmm. You don't want to piss off your evangelist. Stop. So that's <laughs> yeah. incredibly well said. And like, absolutely. Yeah. I love that you said that, Gary, because my um, little 15-year-old sister right now is obsessed with K-pop. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard butter at top volume <laughs> when I've gone <laughs> over to visit her. So it's absolutely right. Just teenagers really do run the world. And mm -hmm. to think mm -hmm. anything less is just truly to, you know, be they ignorant so and just not know. Yeah. So much time. <laughs> So much I don't time and boundless that. energy to love your nonsense. Like, come on, man. I'm just going to keep buying the same shit I've always bought because I don't have time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Shifting gears a little bit to our second audience question. What are your thoughts on shared worlds or world sharing in fan fiction and in online communities? and the implications for how we form connections in this era of increased isolation? Mm -hmm. mm. Good question. That is, that is a very good question. I'm not sure I'm fully understanding it from where I'm, I'm sitting. What do we mean by world, shared world slash world sharing? Like, do we mean like smooshing worlds together or how are you reading it? Just to, like, to me, it so feels like, um, I kind of think it's two separate things because like when I think shared worlds and world sharing, I think of like, you've got a group of creators mm -hmm. all playing. In and co-writing. And co-writing, okay, okay. yeah. Cool, cool. I'm, on the, I'm on the same level. Okay. On that case, I'm really excited about this one, but is anyone else excited? I mean, I'll, just, I'll just say very briefly that um, like in terms of the shared world thing, like some of the best writing that I've ever done, it, like it wasn't fanfic per se, but it was certainly shared world. Um, 
like it, the collaborative piece is, is probably the most fun that I've ever had um, in terms of creating something like sitting around a table and just throwing ideas at each other. I imagine it's what a TV writer's room is like, um, which I've never experienced and probably never will, but like just that, that lobbing round of ideas um, and being like, okay, that's really, really cool. But what about this? Um, and, and it kind of goes to the isolation piece, like to me being able to do it in person around a table is incredibly, incredibly phenomenal. And, and, but you get the same thing from, from doing it online. And I think like D and like D and D is, is like, is about the same sort of energy, especially when you'd be like, when you D and D with other writers, because we all know how stories are told. And so like, we're willing to take that extra risk and, and be like, okay, you know, this would be a cool character moment. I don't want my character to die, but I'm going to do this anyway um, for the drama. Um, and, and so, and, and we're in a shared world there. So I think that it, it, it's, it's powerful, powerful storytelling. Mm -hmm. I, on the level of isolation, um, and this year, uh, I would say I literally don't know where I would be in COVID without my Dungeons and Dragons group and like, not just the Dungeons and Dragons group, but also like last summer. I just pitched that we create a small role play forum just for ourselves and our characters, like for our Dungeons and Dragons group. So we now like write together every Wednesday and then we play together every Saturday. So about like, I'd say 11 to 15 hours of my week, every week is shared storytelling, shared world building and both on the level of like escapism and on keeping connection and on, you know, the fact that these characters can go out and like have a party together, you know, whoa, like they can hug, they can hug. Um, yeah. And I live alone in this, like I'm living alone through COVID and I was really, really careful through the first half of the year because I've been quite sick in the past in my life. I've always gotten a worse version of what everyone else is getting. So I've just been really careful. Mm -hmm. And I honestly think the only reason that I am, that I have not yet like moved back in with a parent is because of the like support, freedom, escapism of that space has like created and has created energy and connection for me throughout this. Okay. Yeah, I, I think I think both of your answers are excellent. Um, and I don't have a ton to add just that it's wonderful to be able to do something together collaboratively. And I think that, you know, this kind of shared world um, work and just creative activity is just like, well, this is a thing we can do together, right? Like this is, this is just an activity we can participate in um, together at this, it either, either, you know, at the same time or asynchronously, like it's, it's a, any kind of way that we can touch is super mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For sure. Um, let's see, it looks like we have time for one more audience question. So let's dive into it. Number three, do our panelists see any similarity between fan fiction and folklore? Can we consider fan fiction similar to things like fairy tale retellings? Is it fanfic modern folklore? This is a good, this is a great question. I, be, before I give my not as good answer to it, there is a very good book by Francesca Coppa um, called uh, Fan Fiction Folk Tales for the Digital Age, as I, I'm pretty sure the title. It's great and super interesting. And there are tons of compelling arguments there um, that they make much better than I will. So there's there's a there's a pretty solid argument that yes, um, pre-existing, uh, and that I think I agree with. You know, fan fan fiction are uh, again, it's it's something that's kind of made outside of the the um, like capitalist wheel of content production for the most part. Mm -hmm. It's something. It, they are stories that people are telling themselves and each other for the pleasure of it. Um, which I think is really good and important. Um, fairy tale retellings is, is is a really interesting part of this question because, like, you know, what what do we consider fan fiction? Like, I would make the argument that Paradise Lost is just Bible fanfic. Mm. Um, so there's, you know, what there's a as we kind of take a story and iterate on it, like. At what you know is is some are we kind of considering things fan fiction 
uh, if they are copyrighted works and like retellings, if they're not, like I think some of those divides are actually potentially artificial, mm -hmm. you know, that there are, that fairy tales and folk tales don't belong to anybody, like scare quotes, right? That they're, they kind of, it, anyone can pick them up and, mm -hmm. and write them or rewrite them kind of without the fear of the specter of copyright. Mm -hmm. um, so we call those retellings. Um, but they're often in practice, not super well distinguished from fanfic and just in that you can kind of sell one and you might not be able to do so with the other. So again, like I think there's, there's a pretty compelling argument that yes. I think I would want to be careful about the word folklore because I feel like there is a way of engaging the concept of folklore in which there is like a reality tied to folklore. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, when we're like looking at pieces for Augur, for example, like we always have to be careful, like when we're reading things as speculative, like are they just speculative to us or are they speculative right. to the people whose stories those would be? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I struggle with this question on that front in so far as like, shared storytelling that is meaningful to large groups of people and engages people on an emotional level. I think that that can be very, very similar. And I think that also like, I think that you end up like some work that I did when I was in uh, undergrad was kind of like the semantics of subcultures. Mm -hmm. So how you have like renormalization processes of sub like within subcultures. So like a subculture might be a subculture to a culture but you then have like normalization of like engagements within that subculture. So right. like, I think that then the stories that are told within those subcultures are very important and tied to those spaces. Mm -hmm. It might not be tied to like their reality in the way that some folklore might be, but insofar as like it helps to shape and ground the conversations and the like morality and the ways of being and the ways of engaging, I think that that is very, very true. Like I think that you'll find mm -hmm. that people engage with certain stories may behave similarly to one another, but not to a dominant mm -hmm. culture. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like both of those. I don't feel like I have anything anywhere near as good to, as I'm just gonna... <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm just nodding along, like, not that I like, that's all awesome. <laughs> no, I'm mind blown. I'm glad I don't have to answer the question. <laughs> yeah, <you're> the easy. <laughs> so it looks like we have time to squeeze in one more last question, so. Do our panelists see fan fiction as a tool for literary critical, literary slash critical analysis? I'm thinking about how some fics that I have read have brought out themes I didn't notice in the original works. I think 100 percent. Like I, I've done this with my students, where like when we look at, um, you know, like like you look at a, a, the existing work, whatever it is um you know why does character x do this why you know why did the author or the screenwriter whoever made make that decision you know is that the only decision that character could make and then we, we can walk it back and then and you know look at um I mean, without thinking of a specific example you know look, look at a, a fan fiction piece that veers in another direction does the choice the character makes in that fanfic also make perfect sense and mm -hmm. and like, like what's the difference between the sort of thing where it's like no the character has to do x there's nothing else that they would do versus um, you know, they could go in any number of directions and it's it's the author, not the author's whim necessarily, but the author making that call for another reason, whether it's tension or plot or, or what have you. So that, there's, there's a ton of space in there um, for that sort of analysis, for sure. Mm -hmm. I think um, building on that, I think it's really useful for figuring out um, things like genre or subgenre or what, like, what can you change whereas, and have the story remain intact? And what can you change in a way that breaks it? Like, what are the fault lines there? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, if, if this relationship is different, does that actually completely change the function and genre of the story? Like, or if this character doesn't have this experience, like, it, is it just something completely different? Um, so I think you learn a lot about what changes are like I would say like aesthetic or superficial and what kinds of changes are structural? Like when are you changing the paint and when are you damaging the foundation, you know, or as opposed what walls can you knock down and, you know, the shape of the thing is still the same and it's still structurally sound. But if you knock down, this wall is load bearing and now you have to like completely rebuild. I think those lessons can be really important. Mm -hmm. 
I think I would also argue like to some degree that literary analysis is not so different from fan fiction to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, like it's all just lies we're making up. <laughs> <laughs> we like, agree on them. Mm -hmm. Like we're just like, yeah. yeah, that makes the most sense right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you're there, but you know, 15 years, someone smarter, better, probably more marginalized is gonna come along and be like, actually you were wrong. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then that'll be real. And, you know, like I could get into paradigmatic theory, but we don't need to go there. We're uh, running out of time. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I see fan fiction as operating very, very similarly. Like it's just experimentation. Totally. How, do we, how do we how do we learn? How do we like commune over this? Like things like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Totally. Um, so it looks like we are at our time, but before we all kind of leave for our days, I would like to give all of you maybe 10, 15 seconds each to tell us how we can support you and how we can engage with the work that you're doing and uplift you as writers. Maybe we can start with Carrie and then go back around. Sure, sounds good. Um, I'm gonna do my classic, which is point to Augur rather than myself. Um, but the Augur Magazine Literary Society is an organization that promotes speculative fiction uh, in Canada and around the world. Um, we run Augur Magazine that is published twice a year. You can find us on augurmag.com. That's the easiest way to support us is purchasing a subscription. Um, and then we also run a conference slash convention slash festival we haven't quite settled uh called AugurCon mm -hmm. uh that will be coming back in 2022 probably at least partially online so mm -hmm. those are those are the best ways thank you awesome um yeah so i a lot of my stuff a lot of my work these days is in um short fiction so um if uh yeah follow me on twitter uh b underscore krilly um, or on my website, brandoncrilly.com. Uh, it's got links to a lot of places I've been published. And so you can check out my work there and, and support those magazines and anthologies because they, for some reason, decided to publish me and so much love to them. Um, <laughs> and if you're into D&D &D and, and gaming and, and writers doing fun stuff, um, keep an eye on either of those feeds slash um, check out uh, a thing on Twitter um, called a bag of giving that has nothing on there yet, but there will be a forthcoming Ooh. announcement. Uh, some really cool stuff in the coming weeks. Exciting. Um, I have put my Twitter handle. Uh, there we go. That one uh, as it, as my name. Um, I can be found at uh, Natalie's Ed most places. Um, my novel Hench is uh, coming out on soft cover with the like cool alt cover on October twenty sixth. So that's pretty cool. Uh, it also contains a new original short story set in the same universe. So I wrote fan fiction of myself. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've decided. Um, it. Uh, I also am. Uh, I'm currently the narrative designer um, for a uh, interactive um, experience company called The Boundless Library. So if you go to theboundlesslibrary.com, um, it's a combination uh, digital document and like physical mail order interactive experience um, things that uh, that um, run sort of from three months to six months. So uh, check that out too. That's also a thing I do. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today and for uh, being big nerds with me. It's been so much fun. <laughs> a pleasure. Oh, thanks for being invited. Yeah, thanks, Yelly. It has, I don't want it to end. <laughs> Yelly, what if we just kept going for another hour? D&D &D panel. <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you all so much. This has been a dream come true ever since I yelled at Twitter, give me names for a fan fiction panel. Um, and now we've done it and it's been wonderful and mind blowing. And I've just seen the comments blowing up. You can all take a look at it later. People going, oh my gosh, this is so amazing. So from the bottom of my heart, personally, and also as a Watts representative, thank you all so much for spending an hour nerding out with us in Natalie's very uh, apt uh, nerd sphere. I love that. I will also be taking that. Great. <laughs> thank you all. Well, thank you so much for having me. This has been a, a wonderful. This is yeah. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> And thank you everyone who's been sitting and tuning in from home. You can find Hench by Natalie Zena Walshots at our virtual bookstore in partnership with Baca Phoenix Books or our official ebook and audiobook seller, Rakuten Kobo.
You have until the final day of the festival to sign up for our giveaway in partnership with Rakuten Kobo. Visit toronto.thewordonthestreet.ca slash 2021-festival-contest for your chance to win one of three special prizes, including a new Kobo e-reader. Remember, for each day of the festival that you tune in, we will announce one bonus entry code. Today's bonus entry code is MINDFUL. Make sure to tune in later today to our panel, Word Vancouver, Poetry for the Future, at 3.30 p.m. with Adrian DeLeon, Angela Rebrecht, Chantal Gibson, and Nisha Patel, followed by Hard Feelings, Processing Trauma Through Writing, with Brent Laporte, Holly Gattery, Jacob Shear, and Kate, uh, Kathy Friedman at 5 p.m. Then this evening, we'll be joined by David Dumchuk to discuss his book, Red X, with Nabin Ruthnam. For more information about this year's lineup, as well as the panelists you've heard today, visit our website at toronto.thewordonthestreet.ca. If you'd like to support The Word on the Street by making a donation, simply head to our website and click Donate Now at the top of the homepage. Thanks again for joining us. Enjoy writing your fan fiction and have a great day.